Okay, this is a BaseNets question. Suppose that a patient can have a symptom as that can be caused by two different diseases, A and B. Disease A is much rarer, but there is a test T that tests for the presence of A. The BaseNet and corresponding conditional probability tables for this situation are shown below. For each part, you may leave your answer as a fraction. Okay, so here's our BaseNet and the conditional probability tables. Our first question is to compute the joint probability of minus A minus T plus B and plus S. To solve this, we just need to look up the consistent entries in each of these tables and multiply them together. So we have this is the probability of minus A times the probability of minus T given minus A times the probability of plus B times the probability of plus s given minus a and plus b. We can read those off from the tables. Minus a is 0 0.9. Minus t given minus a is 0 0.8. And we'll multiply this all together. Plus b is 0 0.5. And then plus s given minus a and plus b is 1. Okay, let's look at question 2. What is the probability that a patient has disease A given that they have disease B? Okay, so this quantity here. Looking at this base net here, we notice that we have that A is independent of B because they are de-separated. So we know that this is equal to the probability plus a and that one we can just read off in the table which is 0 0.1 moving right along on to c we're interested in the probability of plus a given plus t plus s plus b okay that's equal to so using the definition of conditional probability the joint of all these the joint probability of all these instantiations divided by the probability of just the evidence now the probability of just the evidence is the probability of plus T plus S plus B and plus A plus the probability of plus T plus S plus B and minus A now the four, the three entries we're interested in are joint instantiations over all variables. So we just multiply the corresponding entries together, which will give us, in this case, for the first one here, all positives we get 0 0.1 times 1 times 0 0.5 times 1. This is divided by a sum over two terms and the first term is the same as the numerator so this is again 0 0.1 times 1 times 0 0.5 times 1 plus and the last one has plus t plus s plus b but minus a so that's 0 0.9 times 0 0.2 times 0 0.5 times 1 and that's our complete expression over here now we're interested in the following quantity probability of plus a given plus t and plus s okay to find this we have that's equal to the probability of plus b e plus t plus s divided by the probability of plus t plus s which is equal to the joint for plus a plus t plus s and plus b plus the probability of plus a plus t plus s and minus b divided by all terms consistent with plus t and plus s, that will be four terms, it will be plus a plus t plus s plus b plus probability of 
plus a plus t plus s minus b plus a probability of minus a plus t plus s plus b plus the probability of minus a plus t plus s minus b. To compute this, we need to look up all the consistent entries with each of these terms, So, um, which is actually the entry we already computed here, so let's just copy that over. That's 0 0.1 times 1 times 0 0.5 times 1. Then all positive and negative b, all positive and negative b is 0 0.1, 1, 0 0.5, and point 0.8, point 0.1, 1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.8. Then two of the terms in the denominator are identical to the ones in the numerator. So the first one in the denominator we already have. It's the third one is negative a and everything else positive. So let's look that up, negative a, everything else positive, so that's 0 0.9 over here, 0 0.2 over here, 0 0.5, and 1. For the last term we have negative a, negative b, and plus t and plus s. So negative a, negative b, plus t, and plus s over here. So it's actually zero. One of the terms is zero, so the whole thing will multiply together to be zero. And here's our result for this query. Now suppose that both diseases A and B become more likely as a person ages. Add any necessary, necessary variables in our arcs to the base net to represent this change. For any variables you add briefly one sentence or less, state what they represent. Also state one independence or conditional independence assertion that is removed due to your changes. So I'm to add the new variable g, which is the age in years. So we'll have a variable g, which is the age in years, which influences the likelihood of both diseases. What conditional independence assertion do we lose? We lose A independent of B. Okay, now some questions about this new base net here. And for a bunch of conditional independence assertions, we're asked to answer whether they're guaranteed to be true, whether it cannot be determined from just looking at the base net structure, or whether they're guaranteed to be false. Okay, we know that conditional independencies are always possible by choosing conditional probability tables in, a, in the way that things become independent. So never can we guarantee an independence to be false by just looking at the structure of the base net. So that will never be the answer. Let's look at, is V independent of W? Well, V is over here, W over here. To check this, we're going to run deseparation, which means we look at all paths connecting V and W. Once we find an active path, we're done. We know it cannot be determined whether they're independent or not. Um, if all paths have been checked and none of them are active, then we are guaranteed the independence is true. So let's start with this path here. This path is one triple. This one triple is a common cause, so this is active. This makes the entire path active, so this means we cannot determine whether this conditional independence is true until we get to look at the tables, but we're not given the tables. Is V independent of W given U? So V, W, but not conditioned on U. Well, there are a couple of paths connecting V and W. This is the first one. This one is inactive. So we need to keep looking. Here's another path. This is a V structure, but no evidence observed in the child or its descendants, so it's also inactive. Now here's another path. 
This path has a V structure right here, that's an inactive V structure. Once there's an inactive triple along the path, the path is inactive, so this is also inactive. So all three paths connecting V and W are inactive given condition on U. When all paths are inactive, we know that the independence is guaranteed to be true. Let's look at the next one. Is V independent of W given U and Y? So V is here, W is here. Now we condition on U and Y. Well, let's start with this path over here. This is a V structure. One of the descendants in the V structure has been observed, so this V structure is active. The path consists of only one triple, it's an active triple, so the entire path is active. Once we have an active path, we're done with running our deseparation algorithm. We know that the independence cannot be determined from just looking at the graph structure. Moving along, is V independent of Z given U and X? V and Z conditioning on X. Well, let's start by checking this path over here. This path consists of two triples. There's the V, U, W triple. That's a common cause where the cause is unobserved, so that's active. And then there's the U, W, Z triple, which is a causal chain with the middle node unobserved, so also active. So both triples along the path are active. This means the entire path is active, which means we cannot determine from just looking at the graph structure whether this independence is guaranteed to be true or not. Now moving on to the last one, is x independent of z given w? x, z, and we observe w. Well, x and z are directly connected. That is, in that case, um, it's always possible to choose the conditional probability table of z such that there is a dependence between x and z. Of course, it's as always possible to pick a conditional probability table such that they're not dependent, so it cannot be determined from just looking at the graph structure.